I bared my soul to you and it was just you the whole time? Yes. The long-awaited Black Widow solo movie has been out for approximately two minutes, so naturally the internet is already turning it inside out, asking questions like, what does this mean for the MCU? Did that twist work? Where might this dangling thread lead? We thoroughly enjoyed the movie, but no Hollywood production has absolutely watertight logic, so in this video, we are going to take a fair and balanced to look at some aspects of Black Widow that uh, don't quite pass the refrigerator test. And because we're Mavericks here at Screen Rant, let's start at the end. Let's drink. After the airborne Red Room comes crashing down to Earth, General Thunderbolt Ross arrives on scene with approximately 500 shield jeeps. And rather than disappear, Natasha decides to give herself up. Next scene, she's got her kicky blonde Infinity War hairdo and she's heading off to help a cap bust the others off the raft. So what happened with Ross? Let's not forget that at the beginning of the movie, he ruthlessly hunted her down for her actions in Civil War. Were they just gonna sit down for some coffee and discuss Drakov? It seems unlikely that Ross would, you know, just let Natasha leave. And surely if she wanted to give him intel, she could have just sent an email. Director Kate Shortland has said that they left it deliberately ambiguous, which of course is her decision to make, but it still feels like it raises distracting questions for no real benefit. And while we're on that point, does it really make sense from a character perspective? Natasha has just reunited with her family, patched things up with her little sister and freed a new army of Black Widows from Drakov's influence. Wouldn't it have made more sense if she had left with them? After all, they had a lot to talk about. Of course, you could argue that Natasha turned herself in to buy the others time to escape, but let's not forget General Ross and his 500 Jeeps. If they put Natasha in one Jeep, that still leaves a whole bunch of Jeeps to chase Alexi, Yelena, and Molina. And come to think of it, those three would have been pretty useful allies to have when busting Sam, Wanda, and the others off the raft. Hey Cap, you uh, want me to call in my army of Black Widows? Um, yeah, please. The reveal of the Flying Red Room is a pretty cool twist. It's a great visual and it makes for a fun action sequence, but when you think about it, does having a helicarrier type flying base really make somebody harder to find? From the ground maybe, but not from above. And the Red Room doesn't even have a cloaking device like the helicarrier. You would imagine that maybe a shield satellite would have seen it floating around up there and investigated, or heck, even one of Tony Stark's? Nobody noticed this thing floating up there? The movie finally reveals what happened in Budapest all those years ago, something first alluded to back in Joss Whedon's first Avengers, and it's appropriately heavy for something that's been weighing on Natasha's conscience, but there's one question that keeps nagging at us. The explosion that took out Drakov's building was massive and serious enough to leave his daughter Antonia with horrible scars, but Drakov himself seemed to, to escape completely unscathed. How did that happen? Did he get a last minute tip, abandon his daughter, and then escape down some secret passageway? He's an evil piece of work, so that would make sense, but the fact that it's never explained in the movie is odd. All it would have taken was a quick line of dialogue. Come on, Marvel, you know how the internet works. You gotta get ahead of this sort of thing. And speaking of that evil piece of work, Drakov, how does the Red Room's brainwashing mojo actually work? Back in Natasha's day, the Red Room used ruthless methods of indoctrination, military training, and coercive torture to mold its agents, as many real-world agencies do. But with the new generation, Drakov updated his methods, using microchips and mind manipulation so that he has absolute control over his soldiers. It makes for some horrific moments, like the widow that he forces to kill herself, but it's the kind of thread that, once you pull it, starts to unravel things. Does Drakov's control have a limit? Are the widow's true selves buried underneath? How aware are they of what's happening? And ultimately, if it can be undone with red spray, is it actually that effective? Our advice? I don't know, maybe just don't turn young women into super assassins at all? And hey, on the subject of super assassins, we love Alexei. We love him when he's being a doofus dad and we love him when he's punching people. But we have to ask, what is the deal with his powers? 
where exactly did they come from? He describes himself as the only one of his kind, and it makes sense that the Soviets would see Captain America and decide that they wanted one of their own. That's how it worked in the real world, after all. But the MCU has made such a big deal about the importance of Super Soldier Serum and how difficult it is to make, so we have to wonder what the backstory is here. Did they steal some? Were they able to make a small amount but not replicate it? Like, if Drakov is such a well-funded super genius that he can brainwash an army of widows, position them all around the globe and control them from his flying sky base, couldn't he have figured out Super Soldier Serum too? This is more of a character discrepancy, but uh, it's been bugging us. Natasha and Yelena make a big deal about the taking of innocent life. They're against it, as they should be. It's a big part of them growing beyond their past as assassins. But then when they storm the prison to break out Alexei, they seem pretty blasé about collateral damage. Sure, the prison guards probably aren't the nicest people in the world, but they're ultimately just normal people doing their jobs. And while we do see them running inside when the avalanche strikes, it seems pretty likely that in the course of the prison break, some people got hurt badly, maybe even died. But hey, it's a cool action scene, so let's move on. Here's some more behavior that is slightly out of character. After reuniting in Budapest, Natasha and Yelena are on the run from both the Red Room and the US government agencies who are already chasing Natasha. And is it just us, or do they not really make much effort to blend in? Sure, they change their clothes, but as far as keeping a low profile goes, that's about it. They don't even change their hair. Considering that Yelena spends a lot of time mocking her sister for being a big famous Avenger idolized by little girls, it seems odd that they would not try harder to keep under the radar. Not only is she an Avenger, she's a high profile fugitive. With a continuity as big and complex as the MCU, fans are always going to be asking how new information fits into what we already know. And sometimes when things don't fit, it's just a matter of production reality. So the real reason that Yelena, Red Guardian, Melina, and the Army of Widows do not show up for the big climax of Avengers Endgame ultimately is because Endgame was made before Black Widow. That's the reality. But Marvel must know at this point that fans are going to be asking these sorts of questions. So why not slip a line of dialogue log into the movie to preempt the dreaded plot hole conversation. For example, maybe in the post credit scene, Valentina and Yelena discuss how she and the other widows were left out of that final fight. Maybe Yelena's sad because Natasha didn't ask for her help with Thanos or during the blip. Or hey, maybe they all got blipped away. And speaking of Contessa Valentina Allegra de Fontaine, this last entry is not so much a plot hole, more of a curiosity. Black Widow was originally supposed to come out before the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, but of course, the pandemic messed that up. Had things unfolded as planned, when Valentina showed up in the Disney Plus show, we would have recognized her from the Black Widow post credit scene. So even though we know the reason, her two appearances feel slightly at odds with one another, as if she has two introductions, neither of which really tell us anything, but which still sort of rely on each other. Shared universe continuity, man, it is a nightmare. Well, now we know what Black Widow was doing between Civil War and Infinity War, so which other MCU gaps need to be plugged? How's about Hawkeye's brief retirement before Age of Ultron? Hmm? 